we, we, we met and today we met again, but uh, on the different topic, we are talking about the society, law and society. Okay, when you talk about law and society, that is very much related because actually law is the basic or the semen of a society. If a law fail to accommodate the needs of a society, then what is the point to having law? People can take their law in their own hands. That's first one. Second, can law educate society? Can the law that introduced by the parliament can create the awareness, can protect society? Yeah. So this is something that very much intact to us as a stu law student, as uh, people who have like me a background in law, we have to always question because that's why our self is very critical. Become a law student must be very critical. That's what makes us different from other students at other faculty without prejudice. Uh, they're also important, we're important, but we're more important because we have to open our mind and we have to look on certain things very critical. Cannot just simply, it's okay, I'm happy with it, I feel it's okay. You have to understand, politicians who make the things in parliament, they have their own intention. Yes, true. We, we, we elect them through the very transparent process, very um, clear election. However, everyone have their own agenda for their party or for themselves. So we always have to look at whatever the government introduce law to us. You see, it always can be used, can aware, can protect us, can guarantee the rights of a society, rights of the individuals. All right. Okay. Today, I want to talk about a certain law that we introduced during this pandemic. Why I always connect with this pandemic, as if that you say, you doctor, always talking about this pandemic. Can you go out from this? We cannot go out from this because this pandemic is bring three hundred and sixty degrees changes in our life. Previously, I have to fly to meet you. We don't used to have this Zoom. Why should we have Zoom where we can take a flight ticket? direct to Semarang and I like last November I was there I'm happy enjoy Semarang within 48 hours and that is a good for me mm. but now mm. we can't do it so since that we can't do that uh, this is something that for me we have to be very careful and we have to look on certain things that be introduced by the government during this. Okay, for example, I know in Indonesia, the most controversial is the, 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 the job creation law. And I can see that the people are angry, the people are demonstrated because people believe it's not giving anything or there's a less or, uh, impact to, the, to this uh, capitalist or the government, but much impact to the people. So people raise up the voice. As I said to you last week, I see my friends, I see everyone that I know in Indonesia posted things in their social media and say, we're against this law. We're not against the development, but we're against the law that you've done to us and you pass on us. Okay, in Malaysia, um, there is a very interesting happened uh, for a couple of days. First, I want to talk about the sudden... Um, uh, uh, result of sudden uh, decision made by the prime ministers, uh, they, he proposed to the young Pertuan Agung, our king, that he want to have the state uh, to declare the state emergency. Malaysia have done this back in 1969 after uh, the uh, chaos and the. Uh, bloodshed between Chinese and Malays back in 1969, and where the countries at that time, uh, imbalance of uh, the economic between the locals and the Chinese people. So it's a very, very deep wound in the, our history about that 13 May 1969. So from that uh, dark uh, history in, in, in our progressive nation, uh, we actually uh, have the state of emergency for two years, 1969-1971. So we have that, um, we do have that uh, practiced this. However, so sudden the prime minister want to declare the state of emergency, we don't understand why suddenly he made that decision. But he cannot declare by himself because in our constitution, the state of emergency is only can be declared by the Yang Di Pertuan Agong 
after get advice by the prime minister and he must get the bless from the cabinet so he did last uh, friday he met the other person agung and he said we need to do this first because we want to ensure that the covid numbers of the patient in malaysia or the infected will be under control so we are questioned that why suddenly you use covid where is the covid start you know early this year why now second because at the same time uh, anwar ibrahim claimed that he has uh, support from many mps for him to be a prime minister so for him is like i can become a prime minister so the present prime minister believe that his a uh, position is under threat at this moment so he said okay we declare the state of emergency so everything is under the government prerogative uh, the government can can pass the budget 2021 without uh refer back to the peoples or to the com uh, committees or to any uh, other uh, people that can normally give their ideas it's like totally discretion by the government so people are angry why if you done for the covid you should done it earlier and i think there is no need for for malaysia at this moment to have a state of emergency and especially the young people that when they say what state of emergency or well, caught in our bahasa malaysia is darurat you know when you talk about the state of emergency it looks like there is a very serious thing there is like a subversive matters terrorism or something that very big So for us, we are still calm. Yeah, we know the number of COVID is impacted is is high. We we understand. We we know it very well. But why suddenly you want to do this to us? What we are the people are protest. People protest because people believe you actually don't do that for people. You do it because of your political survival. You don't want the the the, the changes in the government. So yesterday. because uh the young pertuan agung also actually don't want to make uh, any decision um without uh, consult the other kings since that we still have the the many kings in every state so yesterday they met at the istana negara they discussed for three hours and last night um i think late evening the the agungs have a press statement and say that this uh king council or majlis raja raja rejected the proposal by the government because they believe the present government can still handle it they no need to make the people feel under threat feel that it's not good feel that the country is not unstable it can give the very bad image at the international and also can make the investors far away from us so based on all this the majlis raja raja rejected that and the yadu pertuan agung say that okay we we rejected this we believe you can continue your life as usual so everyone is like thanks god thanks we don't like the words emergency okay one second the young people is really rejected that idea from the beginning the young people law students all those uh uh youth council and all that say on what purpose you do this to the society why suddenly among all the laws that we passed so far and suddenly you choose the state of emergency so this is you see the impact on the people people are not happy for past two three days we are living in the question even me myself we have a discussion online and say what's the impact the impact is so much if suddenly your president say okay state of emergency even though he say okay the state emergency is only for the purpose of covid still i do believe the people of indonesia don't like the idea and say that it's really a not good at all because the name of emergency give a very bad impact at the international level especially it scare the investors to come because when you use the emergency it looks like the country are unstable the countries are in chaos or the country is actually having a problem in so many things so it's really not good in the short terms or in the long terms that so since that is not happened last night all this uh, disappointed politician they went to the prime minister's house did i don't know what they talk but about midnight they all um 
went back and until today we don't get anything from the government the are uh, the restricted movement order for the klang Bele area um is still until tomorrow so we are waiting that because we supposed back normal on wednesday so are we are you going to continue it or what so because <laughs> for us we need to get prepared we need to get prepared like me for example i work for choose to work from home today and tomorrow and if they say on wednesday there is no more rmo then i can go to work like normal because my area are not the red area it's a green area and the state that i stay is free so how so if you laid in given us the instruction it will affect many people especially private sectors because private sectors they need to uh, schedule their meetings or schedule many things in advance so this is where the efficiency of a government are being questioned by people because you make the late decision is impact on us for you is okay because you are government but for us or the cabinet ministers or your cabinet but for us we are have to deal with your rules and regulation and if you come up today it's still late because it's supposed to be yesterday. Whatever it is, you have to support to tell people, okay, for the Clan Valley, there is no more RMO by Wednesday. So your life continues as normal, or you say we are continuing for another two weeks. But we predict that we're going to be continuing for another one week. That's what I believe, looking on the scenario, recent scenario and the present scenario too. So if you think that this kind of idea that coming during the pandemic is not impact on the situation of the people is wrong, is there. Because that's what I say, every president, every ministers must be very careful with the statement that they do. Everything that they announce is come up to the people. And we as a people at large have to listen because it's impact us. For example, if you don't know that in Malaysia, for example, if you don't use masks at a public place, you can be compound to 1,000 ringgit measure. But at one side, we asked if the people are poor and they cannot provide for the must, can you can you compound these people with that? So they 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 don't answer us. That's why I say it's a good uh, uh, it's a good we we uh, we are very happy to to see that you do well to to uh, you know control the pandemic. But at the same time, you cannot you cannot uh, just ignore the rights of a people. That's why many questions during the website or on the webinar recently, people are talking about law and society, the perspective of the rights of the people during the pandemic and also the law that being passed by the government. So as I explained to you, the, the state of emergency is now no more. So luckily for us, no more. Second, they, um, they already passed the law regarding the infectious disease. So this infectious diseases is to cover the situation during the pandemic. Okay, this is a very interesting law, which is will be a very, very important for you to understand. I don't know whether in Indonesia there is any law that being passed regarding this pandemic that affected uh, the people. Okay, what, what we can say is um, you might you might think that what is actually this uh, infected disease act 2020. This is where the Attorney General Chamber believe during the RMO, the total lockdown of Malaysia of two months, March to April, and then the, I think uh, two, one and a half, three months, sorry, three months, uh, February, uh, March to May, actually there is a many contracts cannot be done well, and also many commercial agreement cannot be pursued because of this. So can you blame each other or can you blame one side or anything regarding this? For example, we do have like UKM have uh, under construction, the children hospital, which is the largest children hospital in Southeast Asia. It's supposed to be finished and be settled and can hand it the key by November because of that pandemic the construction workers cannot work on that hospital. So it's delayed until end of November. And now another RMO come, it's going to be delayed early 2021. So on the delay of it, if you look on the construction agreement, uh, the contract agreement, it cannot be delayed without anything. And the pandemic 2020 is actually not included 
in that contract because that contract is happened to be signed by the previous prime ministers and also the um, the vice chancellor of UKM back in 2011. So that time, no one would predict that nine years later we're going to have this uh, COVID-19. Then we're talking about: Can you blame the construction company for delay the building? Can you do that? Whether, whereas he doesn't have any intention to delay it, but because of the rules and regulation and the law at that time, he has to stop the construction for three months. For the big construction, three months mean you you lost so many. Then he asked for the force majeure. So can force majeure be entertained in this? And what about the contract that cannot pursue because of this pandemic? So this is why um, this law is, is actually uh, uh, not being contested by the people because we need this law. We need this law to overview back on uh, our contract that done by parties between government to private, private to private, individual to individuals, because we do believe that all the parties that enter the contract with the good hands and the, uh, with the clean hands and the good faith. So if they don't understand this, how we want to solve the problem? Because the court in Malaysia is totally said that we don't want to have any problem, any contest, any case regarding this. Because COVID-19 is not something that we predict, it's not something that we knew going to happen, and it's not something that we can control it even until at this moment. In fact, if you if you really read this morning's uh, statement by the, the director of WHO, that there is a few countries will cross the very dangerous line under COVID-19. So that's a very sick, very clear signal to us, not only to take care of ourselves, but also to all the government in the world to have another plan for the people and what you have to do, what's next, okay? So when you're talking about the law and society, as I said in early uh, of this lecture, what actually is impact? What is actually the importance of it? If you read the Lord Denning, um, uh, uh, the UK uh, uh, bench, uh, the highest, the Queen's bench of UK judge, he said, if you want to see whether the, the progress of the society is you look into the law that being passed at the parliament. If the law at the, past at, at the parliament is something that equip, that something that really related, to the recent situation means the government understands the needs of the people. In this part, I agree with the government of Malaysia for having this Infectious Disease Act 2020 because we can see many, many commercial matters can be settled amicably and also we can see that how we don't have to go to court but we might go to the uh, tribunal or to the arbitration only. So we can settle it without have to go to fight court. Second, the emergency of emergency is not like we want, like we like, and we, we really oppose it. The only thing is Malaysian people are not go on route. That's not the tradition. Uh, we did a few times, but we are not like Indonesia because in Indonesia, they are there brave to do that. I mean, in Indonesia, if you don't like it, you find that the government don't listen to you, you dare to be, you know, show the protest. In Malaysia, if you can see that that's not, that is not the way because we have been controlled control for so long since independence inherits by the British idea of uh, the ISA or Internal uh, Secrets Act, where at that time now no more, it's obsolete, it is already uh, Prime Minister Najib before the then the Prime Minister is already uh, took out of this and say that no, it's obsolete, I'm not going to give it anymore. So many human rights groups joined and I enjoy the thing because they believe that it's a deprived right of people. But we are already brought up since 1957 independence. Um, whatever you want to against the government, then you will be locked up for 60 days, no news, no nothing. So Malaysians' understanding is so long, it's like that. And, and we are not brave enough to show because we are afraid. Uh, some people call it the dictator law. Uh, and my and Prime Minister Mahdi before, Dr. Mahdi before, using this thing to to weaken all the oppositions uh, to him during his become the 22 years prime ministers before. So he's a very, 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 very strong, his position, because he weakened this opposition by using this law. So under Najib, Najib said, no, we are 21st century. We don't need this thing. Some people say you can't 
obsolete these things. You cannot just simply withdraw this, but you have to amend it together to the situation. But the human rights group say, we should not have this law. Let people talk. Let people have their ideas. Because you see in our in the constitution, the rights of the people have been protected under the constitution. So if you say that, so don't have this kind of law. So Najib's bow to this and we don't have that anymore. But the problem that we find is later is when we, because that ISA not only used for the political interest, it's also when we have the terrorism issues, we have this drugs issues, we have the communism ideas or any related matters of religion in Malaysia that is not being accepted by the people. For example, in Malaysia, we not recognize Shia. You know, the like the normals, the, the the practice in Iran. So we don't have Shia, and the Shia is not recognized by the Muftis through the Fatwa League. So whoever practice Shia or any others, uh, Mazhab, a school of Mazhab, not the Sunnah wal Jamaah, which is the four Mazhab, you will be prosecuted under the the Sharia law based on each state. Because um, in Malaysia, it's a very unique because. The head of the religion of Islamic religion is the king of the sultan, each state. So the the state who don't have the sultan, like Sabah, Sarawak, Malacca, uh, Pulau Pinang or Penang, that is the only state who don't have uh, and and the federal territory. This is five states do not have the kings, but they have their chief ministers. So since the chief ministers are not the king. The chief ministers are not the one who control the act of the religious, especially we talking about the, the Islamic here, yeah, Islamic because the non-Muslim is is actually is under the civil law. So every state in Malaysia have their own religious enactment, the Islamic religious enactment. So they have their own way to um, treat this kind of uh, any 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 case regarding to the criminal Islamic criminal law. So um, many, many things happen, many things question, because uh, we can persecute people who having the wedlock child. If we have enough proof, uh, we can also punish people who committed adultery. We can also commit it. Uh, we can also uh, punish people who doing theft and whatsoever that accordingly uh, to the Islamic uh, religion. But lately, uh, we have one problem, especially when the LGBT group are grooming. The LGBT group is somebody that you cannot deny their exist. As for me, you you asked me, we have to realize that. We can't sweep everything under carpet. In my society, they always look like even the ministers, all the ministers, especially who are in charge regarding the the family matters or the development matters. They always say that no, 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 we we don't have the problem with that. They are very small group. They are not affect us. They are okay. Then we will try to uh, strive them for them. They're not going to getting more bigger. This actually is wrong. The LGBT group in Malaysia is actually grooming very well. And they like mushroom, grooming here and there. Okay? Um, I have my friends who are gays. I have a friend also who are homosexuals, lesbian. The only thing is they are covered themselves very well like normal people. Why is like that? Because our society are not happen to be open and interact with this group. We are always like, okay, once you say you are gay, you are going to hell, finish. That's it. No way to turning back. The, the judgmental and the law itself make the people are more scared. I have a friend who the post parent a Muslim and say, I don't want to be a Muslim. I don't want to. Then I say, that's your right. You think? I believe if you don't want to believe in that religion, then why have to force the people to believe in that religion? If you believe that another religion is good for you, then go and do it. Oh, if I say like this, that someone will gonna shoot me. If I say this in Malaysia, people say no, it's wrong to say that. You must say that if he's born Muslim, he must die as Muslim. But you have to look in so many other things. What should force people to believe something that they don't want to believe? 
I'm Muslim. Yes, I'm born Muslim. My, fa my family practice Islamic things. But it doesn't mean that I have to agree on every idea that these religious people bring. I will always question. Because for me, is that's what makes our we progress. We have to question the people, especially when they're talking about religion. The more they're talking about religion, because they're very, very impact to the society. I bring the situation in Malaysia. I don't know the situation in Indonesia, because I do believe Indonesia are more liberal in, rather than Malaysia. In Malaysia, no one will say that in the class, if I say it, I always ask my student, okay, put up the hand who is a gay here. I know there is. I know. But the guy will always like, no. Or the girl's like, no. We are normal. Are you sure? Yes. But they can come to my room and talk personally because they know I understand that. And I don't want to be judgmental, prejudiced to anyone on this planet. For me, I have a friend who are transsexual. Many of them are my friends. They come and talk to me, you know, and I never discriminate like, hello, you are a man, you know, when you come to me and talk to me like this. No, I don't have that feeling. I treat them as a sisters. And I listen to them. I listen to the discrimination that they face from the religious office when they're being catched. Because you know one thing, the, the, the stigmatic of our society towards this transsexual, uh, they cannot get a job. If one day you want to get a job, they will say, eh, your name is under ID, it's a, it's a man. Suddenly your appearance is a woman. Ha, 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 ha. You start to get all this kind of cynical thing. People start calling you abang, you know, instead of beast, you are being called mister. So I think these people, and they, they cannot get, they cannot change name and change the their sex in the ID. There are so many, 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 times attempt by this group because they say, look at me, look at me, I'm women. So what should I bear the Malay and also especially the male name on this? Give me my name. No, they go to the, the federal court, the highest court in Malaysia, and they not allow it. Based because if you are Malay Muslim, back to the religious uh, office. What do you expect from religious office? You expect they give you a red carpet? They are not. They will say to you, you are must back, you know, you must repent yourself back to God, change your appearance, be a man, try to find a woman. So I listen to all this problem. You know one thing that sometimes rather we have a law that is very outdated and don't accommodate. Don't say to me that I'm I'm the one who's who say that oh Dr. Salawati said she's the one who fans of the LGBT. No, I don't I don't want to give any comment on that. I have, I believe religion should be tolerant, should be educate people, not enforce people, not punish people in a harsh way. So then you blame that all this transsexual become a prostitute. See, because you decided, because you never give them a chance to be part of a society. You never give them a chance to work accordingly. I have one lecturer, he, she, he's a professor. Uh, in one of this, uh, the faculty in UKM. But his appearance is her appearance. And if you met him, you will know that it's not him, it's her. And he did come to my office, talk to me about the treatment that he, his professor, yeah, he's not an associate professor, he's a full professor, say that my dean, only one or two of my colleagues will accept me like what I am. My dean is always, every time will call me, uh, you know, my previous dean and say that, um, you know what, you, you should change your appearance. You're going to be burned in hell. I was like, what? Yes, that's what my dean said to me. You should change your appearance. You should not be like women. You should be like a man because you bear the man names. You know, you you are Muslim. You are Malay. You don't you don't you don't feel afraid to be burned in the hell. I think that's harsh. We don't have a right to say that to anyone. I believe when you open the laws, you open to the society. You must look at what the society happens. What happened to the society nowadays? So nowadays around the world, LGBT are not something are not common. There's a comment. Is how you look at it and how you want to educate. I don't say that I'm I'm happy with them. I don't say that, oh good, good. No. I a Muslim, I believe in what the my Quran and what the hadith, but I don't want to have the stigmatic towards these people because you don't know their background. It's easy for us to to judge a people. That's why I say why we still have the law that's punished. 
Why don't we have a law that educate? What can we punish from people? Oh, we always say, okay, uh, okay, I think I can in Malaysian scenario because I think it's unfair for me to take Indonesian scenario, whereas I'm not involved in that case. I think I think a Malaysian scenario, okay. One father lost the job, got two children. This is the real case, huh? The children cry for the milk. He tried to ask from the religious department, the zakat, and they say, okay, we have, we don't have any more. Okay, go, we don't have. So the treatment that he get from the religious office that's supposed to give is not good. So he's tried to find a place where they can he can get the money. At the end, he has to go to the, another religion's uh, foundation, like his church or any place, which is the non-Muslim one, and they give him. So when he started to get that, he went to the church, not because he wanted to be a Christian, because he got the help from the church. And people start, you know, make a complaint to this department and say that he might convert to be a Christian. Then he said, I am not, because my Muslim friends, my Muslim community doesn't want to help me. So the Christian community want to help me. Is it wrong for me to get the money to give my children food? You are talking about religion, but you don't have the humanity. And I feel like, yes, that's what is correct to say to these people who talking about their, you know, their songko or their scalp is a good, and I, you know, I'm going to, to the heaven. So this is wrong. And then we have the mother who become a prostitute to give us seven children food. And people start to see, what type of mother you are? You are giving the haram food to your, your child. Then suddenly, we, I, I, I blast the person. Easy to say, huh? where's the father? I say. She's not going to get pregnant, the seven children, without a man. Where is the man? Die? Uh, normally in Malaysia, the attitude of a man, after they divorce the wife, they don't want to give a maintenance to the children. Oh, very bad situation in Malaysia. And mostly happened to the Muslim, because Muslim having the Sharia court. Muslim not settle this thing in the civil court. But the non-Muslim settle this thing at the civil court. So the civil court, the enforcement are very strong rather than the Sharia one. So the, 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 the non-Muslim, whenever they, they, they file the divorce and they divorce, the father and the mother got a very, uh, they join the custody or they have the custody for the children according to the lawyers and also the, what is decided by the court if they have the contest. And then the court say, okay, father, Oh, sorry, I continue. I think I, there is something on the internet. Okay, so the, the non-Muslim father, normally they pay. So we don't have. But for the Muslim father, it's the, um, I can say that the, um, uh, the enforcement towards that is not strong. So when the law is not compatibility between two, the civil and the sharia, you can see that Many of uh, the people, especially um, the kids, I have to face the difficulties because if, I, if the mothers is not the one who have a good job or the good job, then that's it. So we're back to this, the, the women who have to become a prostitute to give food for the seven children. She's not highly educated. Uh, the ex-husband just ran away and like bye-bye with the seven children like you know taking care of it thank you very much I just I just give my sperm and after that that's it so that is the things so for me I always question what type of law that we do have in our country that can give a benefit to the children and also to the women especially to the women I'm not saying that the women normally women is always become a victim in so many things People, criminals, wow, you are prostitute, eee, you are jerk, you are you are cheap women without knowing why she become like that. You know one thing, I I I have my I have my um my own idea. Uh when I was practicing as a lawyer, normally the remand procedures, the remand procedures are under criminal procedures, okay, penal code. Most of the foreign uh prostitute when they come to Malaysia. 
not because they want to become prostitute. They are being lured and being cheated. Uh, for example, like um, women from Indonesia or from Philippines or from Thailand, from any part of the ASEAN country, you say, oh, they are, will go to the area which is the, the ladies come from the rural area, do not know about the world, and say that, oh, okay, I want you want to work in Kuala Lumpur as a waitress? We provide you food, we provide you a house, we provide... So, you know, people who want to get out from the poverty will always believe, yes, I want. But when they end up in Kuala Lumpur as a prostitute. So, are you thinking these people should not be get any respect? We should respect them because they don't know anything. They come to my country because they are being lured by the syndicate. And the syndicates are telling lies to their parents or to themselves. So, when they are in the captures of the syndicate, they give this lady drugs, so then this lady can have 10 men one night. So the money is all by the syndicate. She's just nothing. She's just like a chicken being using. So the, the issue that I want to bring is the criminal procedure court before, back uh, 20 years ago, is always like given to, um, some sort of humiliation when it's come to the remand proceeding. Because when they're being catched by the police or the immigration night, because they're working at night, they must brought to the court for police to have the order to uh, serve them five days, six days for, for the interrogation, to know why. But the way that they do it is humiliating. Why? You know when you are prostitutes and, and being, um, I can say, controlled by syndicate, of course the night that the clothes that you work at that night is a very sexy one. Very short, uh, can see your bare flesh and all that. So with that kind of clothes, they bring these women to court. So, and the court at that time is in the middle of Kuala Lumpur in the Dataran Merdeka. So many people, all the men, the traffic jam was like, wow, see, see the lady, oh, you see them, ha <laughs> this is a prostitute, this is a prostitute. And I can see many of them are very, very embarrassed. And now some running from, from the police without having a shoes. And without the shoes, they go to the court. At that time, I said, no, 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 this is not right. This is something not right. So me and another young uh, lawyers at that time, when I was young, I'm very determined, you know, I'm very determined I'm very, very fierce towards the human rights. Only this time, I'm a little bit sober because I'm 45 years old. When I was 25 up to 35, you try me, I give you my peace of mind, I give you shit, don't try. So at that time, I was very active. I said to the Law Bar Council of Malaysia, this is against human rights. This is again the foreign. This is something that humiliation towards gender, which is especially women. So we bring up this. It's not, it's not easy at that time because people are thinking, this is a prostitute. Why do you need to respect them? This is a prostitute. Do you see the law? The law are not about the respect. It's about the punish. You see? Not something that can educate people, but to punish and make other people laugh. So we say that, no. Where is the human rights? Where are the women's rights? Where are the women's rights groups? Regardless who they are, they are women, they are human beings, they need to be respected. If, even though they are prostitutes, even though whatever it is, give them a proper clothes to appear to the courts, I say. Give them, give them, don't give them short, give them trousers, give them nice t shirts. Don't allow to bring them with the, all the scanty shirts, whatever that they have, because at that night they are at an entertainment outlet. Of course, they have to wearing something like that to, to suit their job, but it's not to go to court, I see. And somehow or other, we also have a male magistrate that laughing and say, wow, you must be very sexy. And we make that and as a sexist remark, as a condemnation to the magistrate who's doing the job. So it's not just easy. Three years, ups and downs, ups and downs, you know. And at last, we get the attention by the ministers, the women ministers. And she brought this thing to the parliament. And since that day, we passed the law and we amend the criminal procedure code where all the remand procedures need to have the uniform. Meaning all the ladies are no more, were, you were looking them to having the remand order from the magistrate with that kind of, you know, scanty shirts with all the sexy, um, uh, whatever the shirt that they wear that night, no. They all change the clothes, wearing the trousers, wearing the shirt, proper shirt, and appears before the magistrate. It's about respect. See, how many laws we do have? It's all about the punished people. And all the people have been punished are all actually the low group or the lower group in society are not the higher group in society. I take one case. Huh? One's a very rich lady being accused, killed, 
his husband, her husband. The, the murder case in Malaysia cannot be remand, cannot be uh, on the bail. You must in the jail despite your remand. But to make it worse, the family say that okay, how much bail that you want us to to go, we will pay. The the court say one million. The family paid the one million ringgit mission. So she free on the police guarantee. So we question if a murder case doesn't matter how many million trillion that you pay, you can't do that because the law says so. Now you see the law can be buy with the money. You have a money, okay? I yes, I killed my husband. I might not kill my husband, but since my family is very rich, I don't want to stay in the jail or in the, any jail or local jail. You know, it's very disgusting. So I want to go back to my house. So I my family pay one million to the court as a guarantee to will not run away abroad. So what about the poor people? They also not yet, you know, uh, show whether they are uh, really convicted on that or not. But they are very in the weak situation. They have to stay in the jail because they don't have a one million. So again, we protest until today and say normally the law is actually done to save, you know, or to being protected only the high class people, not people at large. And of course, that when you talk like that, the government really not happy with you, you know, because everyone, as I said again and again, all the politicians have their own interests, and each politician have their determination to climbing a more high position in the government. So are they really looking at us? No. That's why, again and again, I want you to know that it's a very important for us to know that we must have something that. Uh, uh, very precise law, very good law that can educate our people. And I think one thing's good, one thing's good, which is I congratulate the prison department of Malaysia, is where they amend the law regarding the correction, you know, or the penalties on uh, not severe. I think it's a penalty for those who using uh, doing the small crimes, for example, theft, which is not serious theft and all that. Now, we not punish them in a jail. We have the correctional center, which is now, I think, about four or five correctional centers in Malaysia. We put them in the correctional center instead of in jail. We don't want them to mix with the heavy criminals or the very serious criminal, dangerous criminal. No. We want to educate these people. Many of them, when I, last year, I was, um, I was giving a talk to one of the correctional institutes. In front of me is about 200 people, male and female. When I asked them, how many of you come from the poor family? Almost 90% raised up their hands. So it's direct, clear in my mind, the background of them bringing them to this situation. So who are you to blame? The system. The system of our country who not giving a chance to, for poor people to develop. It's, a, it's really a system. And the system that we adapt today is a system that make the rich become rich and the poor become more poor. So the law that we do have is not educate, it's punish. That's why I said to you earlier of this lecture, please bear in mind, very critical as a law student, look it back. If there is any amendment by the government, look on that, whether the amendment that done by the parliament, is it to educate or to punish or to give a good or to give more impact, especially bad impact to the society. You cannot trust the politician, never, because the politicians have their own agenda for their political parties and also for their positions. No, don't trust them. You must be very critical. You must very agree and very easy to say no. So this is something that's important for us. And uh, also, uh, when I ask them, uh, so what's next in your life? Because there's, okay, one thing bad about Malaysia is once you have the criminal charges imposed on you and you have to have that, um, yeah, you have that criminal record, I can say, your ID have one line, red line, to show you are ex-prisoners. So when you have that kind, when you want to go out to start to build back your life, you can't get it because many of the employees were like, um, no, ex-prisoner, no, she or he might do bad to my company. 
So how long that we have to do like that? I see. If we don't give them a chance to come back as a normal society or member of a normal society, they will always will be bad because only the bad people can have them with the bare hands rather than the good people. So thanks God that the, the, the prison departments accept the ideas of the group. And now they have the, the government also built about more correctional center. We have the, um, uh, I can say the joint venture with the uh, corporate company and also the factory. Uh, we already have the apprentice group where Sony Malaysia and Hitachi Malaysia, they agreed to take 200 of them to work. So we are very happy. These people who background is actually from broken house, poor people, once they finish their correctional uh, uh, sentence, they already have a job. In fact, when they are in the correctional center, they already start the job. The only thing they are under the prison department's, um, I can say the prison department's um, authority that will look on them. But once they already finish the sentence, we will leave them with the company. So we give them back the second chance for them to be a normal person in society. If you don't help them with job, what snack they want to do? They will come back to do the vice criminals, the, the, the crimes back, I see. And they will involve back with this, all these vice activities. So who wants to be blamed? Government. Our law. Because we don't educate. We don't forgive. We punish and punish and feel happy with it. But the rich people are not being punished, my dear, because they have lots of money. They can bail here, they can bail there, they can get a very good lawyers in Malaysia to serve them and had so many, many good lawyers because of a good money. So at the end of the day, when you talk about the law and society, we're talking about rich and poor. We're talking about the treatment between two groups. We're talking about who's who. For example, um, because of I, my position in my university is quite high and I made a mistake. I might be protected by the people, certain people because my position. But if I'm just a normal lecturer like others, I will be punished. I don't like the idea. My idea is whoever you are, if you are the one you know, who do this, you must, yeah, you must, um, uh, you must always have uh, there that you need to prosecute people when they uh, actually uh do mistake the problem that i face is when you want to prosecute you want to investigate the people with the very high cable i mean high cable mean he referred to the people or, or that the ministers the king whatever that they know is very hard for us to do the job but one thing about me is i don't care i said that the more high position doing the mistake the more my determination to to bring the case and to open the file because for me Justice not only look be done, but must done correctly. If you just look like, then that's it. You know, that's meet. Um, this is uh, would not be good. So, again, um, because I want to open the the student to uh, ask me for half an hour, any question, any anything that you want to say, anything that you believe that this morning. Um, wake you up or wake up call for you on certain issue. I bring the situation in my country uh, because I, I don't want to touch in your country because you know better. Uh, this is a problem of ASEAN country, actually. Wherever you go, you still have, you can see the, 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 the situation, whether in Thailand, whether in, in Vietnam, you know, uh, except in Brunei. Brunei, very totally different. But the other country, which is a really have the democracy situation, this is the way. So I open for you to um, to ask me any question uh, and um, I will answer, I try my best to answer it. So, good okay, morning. So anyone who want to ask Dr. Salawati, you can directly ask uh, Dr. Salawati or write down the question on the chat section, yeah? So I want to ask a question. Okay. okay. So as you said that the law must be educating the society, right? Yeah. 
So since the purpose of law is to bind the society and control the people's behavior, do you think that the sanctions or the punishments inside the law is effective to regulate the society? And in your opinion, what kind of law that can educate the society since this function of sanctions itself to, is to regulate the society? Thank you, Prof. Yeah, that, that is not easy job. Yeah, that's not easy job. Uh, Al Nazara, yes, that's not an easy job. Because why? Because the system are been. I mean, for example, in my country, the country is like we already practiced that thing for so long. As I said to you, um, since independence, we have almost of our law is a British law. We inherited from British. So you know, British is not like like US or any countries, uh, at least likely for Indonesia, you have the mix of law, right? So rather than in Malaysia, very static, very act, like all in the books. So it's like you cannot go out from the books. You can have the discretion, but because you are so into it, you very, very the judges especially, like, no, 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 according to this civil, this, this criminal penal code, okay, you theft, so two years in, in the jail. Whereas somehow rather, this guy, just take two cans of milk because the, the baby is sick and he doesn't have a job. Why don't we have more humanity towards it? We don't have that. So that's why I think um, these human rights issues is, is the one that need to, to be addressed uh, accordingly, start from small. That's why when that's why I say law school have a very is a very good place because most of a student like my student after graduate they will join uh, AGC uh, Attorney General's Chambers they will end up as the deputy public prosecutors they will end up as some young magistrate so these people if you do it, educate them from law school about this society and law they will stand up there and just like the oldest generation okay. I don't care. I got, I'm a magistrate. I can use the this civil or the criminal prosecution code up to my limits. And I think that, yes, 20 years, 20 years they give. We all we get. Okay, you know one thing? There is an illegal immigrants um, uh, being, okay, they, they are being trialed at court. Yes, of course, they are illegal immigrants. Of course, they are under, they are doing the uh, against the law of Malaysia. I do, yes, it is. But look at the, the issue. They come to Malaysia documented. Then change to be undocumented because of the issue with the company and all that, and the company hold the, their passport. So the, normally the bad situation is the company hold the passport, and the passport near to uh, the the visa is, uh, for example, uh, being expired. The boss will call the immigration, say, "Hello, I got ten people from Indonesia. I don't want to pay their money, you know. So come and catch them." That's what happened. That's what happened. I'll be fair with you, I'm very transparent. So all the NGOs were only, when we get that kind of call, we say, hello, especially construction site. The boss doesn't want to pay the Bangladeshi, the Pakistani, the Indonesian, because they start to demand like, boss, I, I done my part. So where is my salary? And they hold the passport. So they see, okay, this guy will next month will expire. This guy will another two months. So when they nearly, then they know they don't want to, they don't want this guy anymore. Instead of giving the passport, and the guy can find another boss or can do anything, go back to their country or whatsoever. You hold the passport and then you don't pay their salary. What they do is when another when the day or two days already expired, you call the immigration. And the immigration come and of course when they say, okay, uh, all right. Yeah, you 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 are the one that that's uh, not uh, you know, you against the, the immigration law of Malaysia. Of course they are against the law because of the boss. So and they take all this thing and win at the deportation center. The boy is happy. I don't have to pay. My building is there. I don't have to pay them. Ha, I don't pay to pay their, their visa and all that. Bye. This is a situation. And now it's, it's, it's my times uh, with the group. Yeah, we, we have a special group now under the human rights group. We are now working on it. We're working on it because we say, why punish the, the, the immigrants? Punish the boss. They are the one who wore the passport. And we did we did one case very successful. So the composition done by court, despite they say that it's illegal immigrant because they come is documented agreement that we documented. They just say they actually document. So what you do to them is is really inhuman, and the judge give a composition to the to all those so called illegal immigrant because of the the attitude of the owner of the company. So again, we already we already happy because the judges understand the use of the law. 
But if the others, you don't know. That's why I said to you, the law school is the best for the lecturer to nurture all of you. And when you become a judge, you become a DPPs, or you become working with attorney general's chambers, please ensure the law is to educate and to ensure the prosperity for the society. I understand now. Thank you, Pearl, for the answer. Focus on, okay. Really Thank you. All right. Any other question? Any other question, please? You can write down on the chat section or ask directly for Dr. Salawati. Rafi, you want to ask a question? You don't only ask the question. Oh, yes, yeah, there is one. Rafi Pratama. Yeah. Okay, I want to ask, based on your opinion, is a world without poverty possible? Actually, it's possible. It's possible for me. I think if you go back to the 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 the, um, the way of the Muslim history during the Khalifa Abdul Aziz, under his um, uh, I can say under his tenure as a Khalifa as a head of a government, he have to go out to find the poor people because the people are not poor at that time. He want to pay. He want to give the zakat, the 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 feed to the people because all the people are rich, so they are not entitled to give the zakat. You know, so he have to go to another state, to another state, in fact, to another country to give the zakat. Because under him, all his people are so prosperous and wealthy. Why? Because of the system. The system that we have today is a capitalist system. We inherit from the Jew system, which is will definitely will give only the people with the money advantage. Okay, look, I'm working with my government and uh, I have my PhD. So when you have a PhD, you have the highest level of achievement in education in Malaysia. So your salary will not be the same like the people who have the first degree or masters, yeah. And and um, whatsoever is uh, whatsoever is uh, uh, the more important is uh, what more important for me is when I start my job as lecturer, I already have uh, another level because the lecturer is like if you have only uh, llb different and master different phd different so i start with with different because i already have phd so i'm working very hard so my my salary different from other friends so when you've got the associate professors you will be a jump another position so i got different salary so with that i'm working hard and with my position I'm not only working on my work, I also be invited by the NGOs, by the international organization to become uh, the consultants and become uh, also uh, the external examiner to look, is it true or not? Like for example, of another universities in Malaysia, especially the, the public, in, uh, sorry, um, the private university, because they need somebody like me to look whether is it their law school is in order or not. So they have to pay. All right. So my position, I take my position not to boost myself. Huh? I take example because it's the true. Because if I take someone else, it might be not true. So with my position, I have a good situation. You know, and in Malaysia, I always appear in the TV, in the radio. So people knows me. I'm not like an artist. I'm not the, the actor or the singer, you know, that everybody knows. But at least when I go somewhere, some people say, eh, you are the one who appear in TV, right? So at least certain people recognize it. Okay. Because of that, I give a better life for my family. Of course, I have a husband. Yeah, my husband is doing a small business. My husband is foreigner. So foreigner in Malaysia is not easy to live as a foreigner uh, when you marry Malaysian. Because uh, Malaysian are not an open country. We are not the country that... Uh, uh, like US, or no, we not practice dual nationality. So what we want to do is, I want to tell you that as a as a foreigner in in my country, my husband having many bureaucracy thing to do his business. 
the corruptions officer who asked him the bribes just because he's foreigner. They thought we have lots of money, you know. But because of my position, I managed to send my children to the international school. Why I send them to international school? Not because I want to show off that we have lots of money. No, I'm struggle. I still have to find more money because the school is actually quite expensive. But because my children not good in Bahasa Malaysia, all the national school is talking in Bahasa Malaysia. And my kids are English better than Bahasa. So you know, if I send them to the national school, the children, my children will not get the full attention from the teacher. Because they, they might be lost in transition. They don't know what they're talking about. But like my children that say, if I say in Bahasa Malaysia, lima belas. And my children say, what is lima belas? It's a 15. Oh, okay. Uh, even if she failed in Bahasa Malaysia test because the, the teacher put the chair. She, 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 she write chair. So actually, it has to be kerusi because in Bahasa Malaysia, chair is kerusi. So she said chair, so she failed. Because she's still wrote in writing. So I know my children, they are not good in Bahasa. So I have to send them to international school. Not because you just want to show off. Because you want them to get a proper education because the language barrier. So in this case, I see my children getting more better than others. Because international school, uh, based on British system, they have the way of critical thinking and all that. So my children at the early age, they can think more different. So I look at it. That's why I educate them. Why you have to say thank you to God? Because you will be in that school. If you are in a normal school, you see you see the school near our house is a government school. You see many poor people there. And somehow rather the children, the government have to prepare the food, the breakfast scheme for this because they know they don't have a food at home. So we have to do that. So I say, why is like that? Because our system is to tell us, for those who have money, you can send. Those have money, you cannot. I feel sad. I feel sad by myself because I'm I'm educate people not to be live in poverty. But how come I do? My government I still believe okay, Malaysian practice capitalist. So and the rich people can simply send. Even you look at me, I send my children to international school. Still, if in the class, I still the low class in that. Because why others all with the big BMWs, uh, SUV must this X6 BMW, 2 million, 1 million car. I still drive a normal Toyota car. I don't have a BMW and miss this. I'm happy where I am. So I tell my children, it's not about the car. It's about the contributions of society. It's about how develop ourselves. So when we don't have the system that develop the poor people to be better in future, what they can do? You know, somehow rather, people not because they are stupid. They become poor not because they are stupid. They not giving a chance to prove themselves. Many situations. I found out many children from the lower group. They're actually very excellent, very brilliant. The only thing, the parents is actually, you know, do not have the money to send them to the school like my children attend. And this also because they don't have anything to equip. Okay, look like now, it's a lockdown. You think, what else for the poor people? They can't go. They don't have the smartphone. They don't have a laptop like what we have. My kids have, each of them have a laptop. And now they're having on their online class downstairs. The teacher is in front of like, I'm talking to you. So they are still on okay. But the other children, mother doesn't have a laptop. Mother doesn't know many very basic, no internet at home. What else do you want to do? What online you're talking about? So these poor people will definitely lost behind. So for them, RMO is what? No foods, no salary. The lockdown means more poverty, more suffering. So if you're talking to me, how it's happened, for me is the government have to have a very good system. And there's no one in this world have that system. All the system that bring rich to more richer, because the rich, as I said to you, the business, People actually cover the politicians. Politician needs money to campaign. And they, they have a very nice special relation with the capitalists. The capitalists were always there. Look at the contract that they're given by the government. Always decide. They say, okay, we have the very transparent contract. We have the transparent. We don't give to our cronies. No, it's bullshit. They do. 
The only thing that they, that, that other company that they give is might be the niece of the ministers, the husband of the niece of the ministers, somebody that you 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 don't know or you don't you cannot connect, but actually they are very much connected. So if you ask me, actually we can do it, but we don't want to do it because the politician, the all this royalty will be affected by that. So that is a program, a system in our system that let these poor people are still in poor situation. So we have a labor group, and labor group is very important for the election. We can only have one during the election campaign. What do you want? What do you want? But we're not going to do it. We want our vote, their votes. That's what happened around us. Okay? So if you ask me, it's very possible, but none of the politicians in the world will do it because it will disadvantage their potential and also will affect their chronism and corruption. Okay, so... Any more question? Jorgi, you are raising your hand. You can ask directly to Professor Salawati. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, sir. I want to ask. Can I ask a question? Sorry, can you say it louder, Georgie? Okay. okay. So I want to ask a question. Since you say that uh, there is a two groups between the rich and the poor groups, who the rich one have a uh, lot of advantage in the in the eyes of law i just want to ask uh, how can we make this group equal in the eyes of law thank you okay all right in the eyes of law actually you know that right uh, and uh, always say that everybody is the same equal in the eyes of law that that what we learn what we we learn in the law school right but when the practice no it's not that Okay, why I say like that? The treatment itself, from the beginning, from the beginning, I take the situation in Malaysia, yeah? So easy for me to explain, okay. Okay, put it this way. One was from the lower group being um, catch by police because of the small drugs that he tried to sell. Okay, drugs, as you know, in Malaysia is a death penalty. Okay, it depends on the what type of drugs. If it's marijuana or uh, I think that one is a little bit lower. But if you talk about heroin, morphine, certain, uh, I think 0.5 gram, death penalty. Okay, very straightforward, uh, very British way. So, when the, small, when the people are from the rich family, do the same, and the one from the poor family, I bring these two scenarios, both of them having the same criminal charges. But the treatment of a police, because the deputy public prosecutor in Malaysia, if they want to bring the case to the court, they will really rely 100% what the report of the police. So normally, normally, if there is no interference from the public and public doesn't know the rich people involved, they bribe the police. So the police will definitely temper the evidence. For example, if the... The drug will be high, suddenly you found out it's very small amount. So it will be redundant, right? When the first report and the second report by the chemical, like, oh, hey, when we catch him, he got five kilos um, uh, morphine. Why suddenly it's only 0 0.5? So at the beginning, it's already redundant. And the law, it cannot be that way. You must be the same. So at the end of the day, this rich people case thrown out. But the poor people, because he doesn't have anyone talking behalf of him, no good criminal lawyers, no one can come because the family doesn't want to give him money or don't have a money. And who are you? You just nobody. No one that can you not benefit us. So he have to face the death penalty. So you, you that's why I said the system itself, the from the beginning is the police system. In Malaysia, the police, not the court, because the court is only get 100% from the police report. That's why, for me, the corruption happened actually at the police, especially the, the, the criminal section. Because they can temper the evidence, they can make the evidence more higher, because if they have. How many cases that in Malaysian court that the, we prosecute the police who temper the evidence, especially the drugs? Because... If you got a problem with them, they planted the drugs in your house. And suddenly they come, hey, we got information that the drugs in your house. Of course, because you are the one who planted it, I said. So how many people are being death penalty, being hanged for nothing? 
There are so many in Malaysia. That's why there's a movement back nowadays in Malaysia by the uh, by one lady. Uh, coincidence, she was my previous junior in my my school. Uh, she's the one that educate and now campaign, but the unfortunate the government are not look at her campaign. She's campaigned for the please do not have death penalty for the drug cases because there is always a tamper of evidence from the beginning by the police. So she said the the rich people always run away, always run away because the police involved, the parents pay the police 50,000, 100,000 ringgit. So the police reduce the, the tamper, the throw the, the drugs because it's all under their control. So they say, oh, actually your son is only, you know, have a 0 0.2 gram of heroin. It's not going to death penalty. It's nothing. And then they re, they do it diabetic and and then the court say, wow, it's redundant, blah, blah, blah. I think you need to prove. So we throw in the case. So happily out. But for these people, they will be in the jail for 25 years, canning seven times, go out all already, poor, poor, and die poor. So we, we want to see this, this not happen. That's why I said, how far that you trust your police department? If you ask me, no, no, not. My own experience, no, no. I just give you one very, very specific example. Accident cases, one guy hit my car. So since that he hit my back of my car, so of course his fault. So we went to this police station and I said to the police, since I don't have many cars, I need my cars because I have a class on Monday. Things happen on early morning Friday. So the police said, okay, no problem. We can give you a car. Serious, I said. Well, I need to claim the insurance. I need to send to the uh, mechanic. No, no, no problem. We do it for you. But perhaps you pay us. Huh? Serious, I said. I was like, I need my car, you know, by Monday, have a class. I say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do it for you. Serious? How about to fill up the... Because in Malaysia, if you want to claim the uh, insurance, you need to have the... The, the sketch of the scenario by the police and all that. Normally, they take about two weeks, you know, to release the sketch. Suddenly, for uh, for me, because I say, okay, I, I really want to give you the, the bribe. I'm willing to pay, I say, because I need my car. Okay, you pay. This afternoon, your, your report will come out. I was like, fantastic. Then I pay them, and my report come out. They bring my car to the mechanic. My Sunday evening, I got called by this mechanic, come and take your car. And you want me to trust them? No. No. It's only a traffic case. What about drug case? What about murder case? They can tamper everything. Yes, they are. They can have an idea with a DPP, a corrupt DPP. Ah, these people are there and they are not rich. Ah, let them have. So the KPI for us is look nice. Yes, it is. This is happened. And if um, I can tell you, there's many cases is that the DPP, Deputy Public Prosecutor, have a bad man with the police, take the bribes and make the, the these innocent people are look like he's really do the job, really do the crimes. Don't you know that you send someone which is innocent to the to death and also to be in uh, in in the jail for so long? Yes, it is. So equal in front of a law, it's not in practice in books. Yes. Okay, Yoji, hopefully. Okay, it's clear. Bro. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Still, we have another seven minutes. Any questions? Okay, Scholastica. Scholastica Probo. You can ask Dr. Salawati. Okay. Uh, Assalamualaikum, Prof. So, my name is Scholastica. Yeah. And I want to ask a question. You know that law is, contains three values, like justice, expediency, and legal certainty. And those three parts, practically cannot accommodate each other proportionally. So in Prof. Madia perspective itself, which one is more important? Thank you, Prof. Yeah, yes, I agree that, um, let you say it. Um, you know one thing, yeah? uh, it's not easy when you talk about justice. Uh, justice is something that very uh, jurisprudential. Jurisprudent things, you know, uh, you might look things different from when I look things. But we have a law that try to make everyone is equal and everyone can respect. But you have to understand this is main-made law. 
whatever the law that we have in my country or in your country, it's not a God laws. It's a man-made laws. So we're talking about man-made laws. It still have a loopholes here and there. So for those are people who know how to use the that kind of loopholes, they will use that to benefit them. But if you if if you are the one that understand uh, this thing very well, you will know that despite this kind of thing, you're not going to do that. You know that this is for everyone to serve. But you have to look case by cases. For me, if the man-made law still, you must have the discretion. I always believe there is an except. Um, I can say that exceptional clause on every law. You can't punish people fully just because it's written in the book. You must punish people according to the situation. If I were a magistrate, I don't want to punish the guy who's come back to me in a very bad scenario and say, I actually have only two cans of milk because my daughters, both of my daughters are crying at home. I don't have money. No one wants to help me. I need to give them food. I know I did wrong, but I don't have anything to give to them. I blame back on the society for fail to help him. I'm not going to prosecute him. For me, maybe if I want to prosecute him, it's a very mild prosecution. Not to use that two years for two ringgit. It's happened, you know, and people angry. One unemployed father with the three children, the wife ran away because he doesn't have a job, just leave the small children with him. So he's the single father, lost his job during RMO, uh, and uh, he doesn't have people, he doesn't have a family want to help him. Everyone ran away from him. So he said, my youngest baby was about six months crying. I need to buy, I don't have money. So he just get one small can. And he being, um, the, the magistrate gave him two years jail. For that one can of milk, I said, that must be crazy. So what we do, we sign the petitions. We angry here and there. We say, you are wrong, definitely wrong by using this because he's not in the position that he can defend himself. So again, uh, Solastika, you see, eh? these things, you need to be very, um, pay the attention that the loopholes in the law, it can be used for the people to use it in a good way or in the bad way. So. When you practice as a lawyer, if you defend someone, defend because up to what limits you can. And I always encourage the young people to do pro bono. Uh, at least one year, you take one pro bono criminal case. Then you will see what type of human being that you meet and what type of society that we live. Because I do believe all of you, the family are doing well. Uh, not in the, not from the poor family, not the area where where you're living, you know, uh, like in the, the area where it's so all the criminals, all those kind of things. No, you, I do believe, come from a good family, good life. So once in a while, you need to be there and listen. So you will appreciate your life and you will doing better how to enhance the legal system in our country. Okay. Oh, we only have two minutes. Okay, it's the last question. We have two more minutes. If there is no question, I want to ask Professor. Yes. I am curious about something that you say. Mm -hmm. uh, law needs, uh, or law should be educate the people. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, how can law educate the people? Uh, when I say the people, like uh, every layer or every part of the people, such as the poor people or the rich one or the politician. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so how can law educate the people? The way to educate the people. Okay. That, that is my question. Okay. All right. Um, as I said to you that, that's why um, our, 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 our role is very important, your doctor, because why? Uh, we as a, as a teacher, educator at the law school, 
that is the very basic to, to tell the student from the first year, first day, first semester, why you are there are in the law school. Because we want to educate them to understand the legal matters. The legal matters is not about to make money. Everybody are talking about commercial, about all those international things to make money. Yes, there's nothing wrong with that. But how we want to educate is when you want to pass the law, ensure that we take part in that. We cannot just simply like leave it everything to to the to the um, to the government to do that. Okay, my government previously loved to pass the law, even until midnight, and then people don't want to listen. You know, their session like in the midnight to do what? And somehow, rather, the very bad of them is they put the law on the table. So they say, okay, we pass the bill, we pass the bill, and we say, what the bill you passed? We passed the bill regarding this, regarding that. I said, no, 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 no. We always say, okay, please, where is your feasibility study, where is the composition of the people that you refer to before you pass the law? And they failed to do it. So I said to you, what we need to educate is we have to ensure that the law that passed by the government need to cross first us. Because you cannot simply just pass the law or amend the law like without without have the feasibility study to the to the stakeholder. You know, and if they ignore us, law school, that are very bad governments very bad previously my government is like that but lately for past 10 years they, re, they know that the educations uh, that the, all the lecturers in law school will do research and the research are more precise and accurate so they start every time they want to amend now the technique is they give it to us to help them to amend so i was in the two of them at enactment that, that we act we really work on the act and uh, we will table so when they table to the to all those MPs and the MPs read, that will be more precise because we will always put the explanation on each of the clause, why we do that. Because if the politician or the AG, they just simply do it and that's it, finish. But now the AGC also invite us, invite others NGOs, because now we want to know that this is how we educate the people. So every part of the society take part in that particular laws. Uh, that's why the state of emergency is not being uh, consulted to us. So everyone is angry and luckily it's not happened. That's very enlightening, <laughs> Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay. So it's already 8.32, Professor. Yes. So, yes. Uh, you can give your closing statement maybe before you close the class. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's always uh, happy to to without even though we are we are more thousand kilometers apart, but still happy to see the student. And as usual, uh, your student is always take a very active participation with me. I'm very happy. No problem. And I still have another round by uh, ten o'clock. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Indonesia, guys. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor Salawati. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much so, for having me this morning. Everyone, Take care. Professor Salawati will have another session at uh, ten a.m. Uh, regarding COVID nineteen and law and development. So you can join uh, Professor Salawati session at ten. Uh, thank you, Professor Salawati. Thank, thank you, you very everyone. much. Thank you, Pak Pulu. Most welcome. Uh, I'll end the session here. Uh, hmm. Terima kasih, Professor Salawati. Sama-sama kembali. Wabarakatuh. Wassalam.